The contradictions of our current economic system are fully in view. A pandemic that in some ways is indiscriminate has swooped in and, and revealed all of those cracks and fissures and the bankruptcy of a political and economic ideology that has had the country by the throat. And so coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done just take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Welcome to these special home-recorded episodes of The Laura Flanders Show. I'm glad to have you. Princeton professor Eddie Gloud Jr. writes about the ways in which these United States of ours are often not very united, nor even very state-like when it comes to serving the public good. His latest book is Democracy in Black, How Race Still Enslaves the American Soul. His forthcoming volume is tentatively titled Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and Its Urgent Lessons for Our Own. Professor Gloud is joining me now. Welcome, Professor. How are you today? How are you? It's such a delight to be here with you to have this conversation and to see you. <laughs> All right. So you said back in 2016, or you may have written it in 15, that the times are dark and the choices are to wake up or watch America burn. That's something that you wrote in Democracy in Black. As I thought about that today, I thought, oh, is this it? Is this the burning? Has our waking up come too late? What do you think? Perhaps um, the contradictions of, of, of our current economic system, uh, the contradictions of an ideology that has in some ways had the country by the throat for 40 to 50 years. The, I mean, there are, they are fully in view uh, where you have a society organized around competition, the pursuit of self-interest and greed, where you have a society that presupposes disposable people, where you have politicians exploiting fears, deepening divides, uh, a pandemic that in some ways is indiscriminate well, has swoop, swooped in and, and revealed all of those breakages, all of those cracks and fissures, um, and, and has in some ways revealed the bankruptcy of a political and economic ideology that has had the country by the throat. Mm, no, it's an ideology, but it is also a, a state of affairs. And you have another great line in the book, in that book, where you say, in the end, this is the society we have. This is the society we have all built. Um, it doesn't feel like a whole lot of a society in the response to this COVID. Everyone doing things differently and differently for different people. You know, I mean, it's, it's absolutely true. What I was trying to suggest there is that, you know, we've built this place true. America reflects in all of its contradictions and all of its inequalities, it reflects a set of commitments, a set of values that we need to understand. So this idea of some kind of collective sense, a sense of mutual obligation, an idea that we live together in pursuit and in light of certain goods has been tossed to the side. So in this moment of crisis, you have to deal with death alone. You have to deal with grief alone. Government is bad, right? Your trauma is yours alone. And so the fact that policy decisions have been made that have really exacerbated, right, uh, the devastation of this catastrophe, right, can't, we can't really talk about it as a kind of collective, a collective moment, right? It's reduced to these very individualized, private experiences because we have lost an idea in some ways 
an experience of mutuality. Did we ever have it? I mean, did we ever have that sense of a of a we in this country that was truly a we? Well, you know, it's always been a we that has been deeply racialized, deeply classed, gendered. Uh, it's heteronormative. Uh, it's it's shot through with uh, all sorts of limitations. The we has always been a so, a source of contestation in, in, in this place. So I don't wanna say we've never had it. I think we've had a more robust idea of it being an aspiration, right? That the idea of we mm -hmm. the people has been an aspiration in moments that we've tried to strive for. But over the last uh, few decades, we've thrown that aside. We the people has been reduced to the top 1%, top 1 tenth percent, those folks in gated communities. Uh, we the people have been, has been really just uh, an idea uh, suited for a crude, crass ideology of greed. I mean, I've been so struck by it in these times where, in this pandemic era, we realize we really don't have a public infrastructure that is up to snuff. Um, why? Why have we not, the richest country in the world over these centuries, built such a basic thing that most countries have most developed western societies have they may not be great but they have them i mean you know i think it has something to do with a certain understanding of the role of government right there's a way and there's there's a particular uh political position uh that holds that big government is always uh bad uh, it is intrusive uh with regards to liberty and freedom uh, where people appeal to notions of liberty and freedom by way as a way to protect their advantage. Um, and so the idea of the public good um, has uh, in some ways been under assault by an ideology that views government, that pursues an idea of public good, right, as necessarily bad. And this is really rooted in critiques of the great society and critiques of the New Deal, right? When you think about these moments as moments of government trying in some significant way to address in one instance, economic devastation um, and, and understanding that government has to do uh, uh, a cert, has to play a certain role. And then in the context of the great society, government trying to address deep inequality, racial inequality, that's a long leg the legacy of, of white supremacy and slavery, right? In both instances, government is being viewed as intrusive, taking freedoms from certain folk, right? And then reallocating resources mm -hmm. to undeserving folk. And given that read, government is, ha, is viewed as bad, right? So whether it's so, the social safety net, whether it's public infrastructure, whether it's public health care infrastructure, it's all viewed as taking something from deserving people and giving it free to undeserving people. So you're saying that we don't have an effective national health care system, a rural medical health care system, a successful public education system because we don't like big government. I mean, people were less hard on the New Deal than they were on the Great Society and the War on Poverty. They were okay with helping poorer white folks, weren't they? Then more okay than they were for helping blacks and farm workers, for heaven's sake, women? So those undeserving people are often black and brown those undeserving people are, are, are more than likely uh, poor people of color, right? So in the context of the New Deal, we know uh, the limitations. We know what Dixiecrats, Southern Democrats insisted upon uh, as D Roosevelt sought to, to respond to the devastation uh, uh, that had uh, in some ways overwhelmed the country. And we knew, we know that black folk were limited, were uh, kind of excluded from FHA loans. We know that black folk were excluded from many of the social programs that, that kept people afloat. And, and if we can tell a story about the wealth gap, the rise of the white middle class, that, that rise is on the backs of black and brown folk. We know that. We know when Bobby Kennedy goes down to the Delta of Mississippi and rubs the face of that young black girl, suddenly the face of poverty is black. And all of a sudden we get the tax revolt in California, right? We get all of this, right? Calls for law and order and the like, right? So we know when we say that the country has been built true, that the inequalities we are experiencing, it is a direct result of a racialized ideology 
an idea of whiteness, which accords the, which of course the benefits and burdens of citizenship to particular folk and view other folk as just simply acts of charity, as philanthropic gestures. And the result has been in some ways, a society that claims to be democratic, but it is deeply, deeply mm. not democratic. To put our finger on it, you say that inequality and white supremacy are baked into our failures to provide for the public good at this moment and have been for decades. That means white people would rather have no health care system than possibly share it with black people. How do we unravel that? That's deep. You know, I think we got to tell the truth, right? We've been dancing around this in the context of political debates where people will say that the reason we don't need health care is because we want choice. Uh, the reason we uh, don't want a living wage or we don't need a safety net is because folks are lazy. They, won't, don't, they don't want to work. They don't want to pursue the, you know, the, the American dream and, and all of the values that come with it. Those are all lies. We need to just simply tell ourselves we've been lying about the current circumstances. Um, and, and then confront the fact that there are a group of Americans, white Americans, right, who we can't convince. And well, let, me, let me see, what, let me explain what I mean by that, Laura. I mean, so, <laughs> so, so we spend so much time trying to convince those who hold noxious commitments not to hold them. Right. And then we compromise with them. And particular groups have to bear the brunt of the compromise. I'm of the mindset that we have a finite amount of civic energy, a finite amount of political energy. I'm not interested in convincing Trump voters to have different commitments. I'm not interested in convincing white racists that they shouldn't be racist. I wanna spend my civic energy building a world where those commitments have no quarter to breathe. And so I think what we need to do is to confront the lies understand that we have been scapegoating black and brown people for our own self-interest, to deconstruct this notion of whiteness as Wendell Berry argues in The Hidden Wound and others, right? To deconstruct it day in and day out to free us into being a different kind of people. That's gonna take a lot of hard work, but it's also gonna take some work where we don't have to spend our energy focused on these folk, right? Who would rather throw the whole thing in the garbage can than actually being true to what mm -hmm. we put on paper. So how do we do that in these times? You're very hopeful about street action, street mobilization. You're inspired by the movement for black lives. You're in Ferguson. You're inspired by um, Reverend Barber's movement in North Carolina. It's difficult for us to be in the streets right now, or we have to at least be very careful. Um, did, again, are we too late? Did we wait too long? What is your sense of where that remaking that change comes from now? Um, there are moments when I'm really, really profoundly uh, skeptical um, and pessimistic, uh, reaching, for, reaching for my liquor cabinet, right, <laughs> on a regular basis. But, you know, I think, I think every crisis, as Stuart Hall, the, 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 the late British uh, theorist, uh, used to put it, following Gramsci, every crisis is a conjunctural moment, right? It's a moment of catastrophe and possibility, right? The contradictions of our society are in clear view. The idea of, of, of raising the tax rate, right? As AOC suggests, was unfathomable a couple of years ago. So the idea of, of Medicare for all, the public option is now the safe choice. Right, Just, you know, in 2008, we couldn't even talk about the public option. They would take it off the table immediately. In the midst of this catastrophe, our imaginations have been unshackled. And I think it's time for us to kind of be bold, right, in what, what we envision the country to be. And that can happen in these spaces, the work that you're doing. It could, hap it could have happened in the Bernie Sanders campaign, right? Uh, it can happen in terms of how we hold the Biden campaign uh, to a certain kind of standard. It can happen down ballot, 
in the election cycles, and it can happen in the way in which we uh, think about our being together post COVID-19. So this is me sounding like the abstract professor, not the organizer. But I think the conditions for us to imagine ourselves differently are, are really ripe, right? It's just a matter of whether or not we have the courage to do so and the occasion to do so. Mm. And I think we do. I have to bake my all on it or I'm going to drown in Jameson. <laughs> Gramsci, who you referred to, talked about that space, the interregnum between what is now and what is yet to come, what is dying and, and what is yet to come. And he called it um, being filled with morbid symptoms that it couldn't feel more literal than it does right now. Putting life into this moment is challenging. Uh, you got a lot of inspiration from the Bernie Sanders campaign, but you had your reservations. Um, learnings for the future from this moment, from that campaign, what do you think we need to take away uh, from this into this new world where we're building? You know, I, I, I only wish that Bernie Sanders could have talked about race in a much clearer way. But I think what his campaign revealed is that we don't need to be, oh, let me say it differently. We can put aside the triangulation of the DLC and Clintonism. We can be boldly progressive in public space. If we only just put forward our vision of who we can be together, we can inspire others and then we can move the country, right? Uh, we have been so, we have conceded over and over again to the terms of political debate. And what the Sanders campaign revealed is that we didn't have to do that. We didn't have to do that. And so moving forward, as uh, we deal with is to get Trump out of office. That's my view. Um, um, but we have to get him out of office without compromising our vision for the country. We have to still push an agenda. We can chew and walk at the same time. So it seems to me, you know, Wallace Stevens says, God and imagination are one. And, you know, there's a line in Emerson where he says, God speaks to us through our imaginations. In both of those formulations, we have to be able to do some vision, some freedom dreaming, as Robin Kelly would say. We have to envision the world, imagine the world differently, and then act on it. So mm -hmm. part, of, part of what I'm trying to suggest here is that we have to begin to speak boldly about a living wage, speak boldly about Medicare for all, speak boldly about workers having a say so in how companies function or having a percentage, owning a percentage of companies. We need to speak boldly about a broad democratic vision and then we can pull the country, right, I think, to the left if we mobilize, if we mobilize and organize. Um, whether or not that's, that will happen, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, well, we, well, time will tell. Um, your next book's about Baldwin, James Baldwin, and Baldwin exactly speaks to heart, he speaks to vision, speaks to the things you care about so much. He also speaks, as you do, to the psychic pain and trauma of living in these times as a black person and also as a white person, beautifully, he talks about. Um, in this moment, I'm very struck, especially being outside of New York, that the public discourse, the, the, the mainstream, as we call it, I call it the, the money stream discourse, um, is all about an economy that's shut down, about people who are at home, um, with a few moments of celebration for the heroic emergency workers. But this society is mostly not shut down. I mean, there's an awful lot of people working um, because they have to, uh, working because people are requiring them to, whether they have the protections they need or not. Um, and there's a disconnect that Trump is obviously exploiting in his ramping up of we should open the country. Um, people feel shut down in their ability to make a living. And I'm struck by how we live in America with these contradictions. We the people, but with slavery. Um, we're all in the same boat, except we're obviously not. Talk about that. And what, how do we change that? How do we relieve ourselves of the burden of this deep contradiction, this, this cognitive dissonance that this country seems to put in at the core of our being. Yeah, I mean, I think it is to first acknowledge that it's at the core, right, and not an exception. You know, this is to put aside Gunnar Myrdal's formulation of the American dilemma, 
that somehow the problem is that we're not just living up to our ideals, right? And if only we changed our practices, right? Then we would be okay. No, we need to understand the very imagining of America carries with it the very contradictions you're, you're alluding to. So at the very moment in which we're giving voice to an idea of democracy, right? Where not only do we have slavery, we have the extermination of Native Americans, right? right? At the very moment in which we're imagining ourselves as a democratic space, right? We call ourselves the empire of liberty. And what are we doing in Cuba and Haiti and Puerto Rico? How are we imagining Puerto Ricans in some ways? What are we doing with Japanese uh, Americans and in internment camps? In each of these moments, we see the exception that actually proves the rule of who we actually are. I think, so I think that confrontation, because Baldwin is really key here. Baldwin begins with the interior. Right? He wants to start with the messiness of who we are, our own wounds, our own traumas, uh, the fact that we haven't grappled with the pain and the hatreds that, that circulate in our being. Because he says the messiness of who we are on the inside evidences itself in the messiness of our arrangements on the outside. Yeah. And so he moves from the interior to the exterior. Right? So, there's this, so when you read him, he's, there's this kind of honesty that is very difficult to, to, to do. I didn't think I was gonna survive writing that book, right? Because he was, is so, he's so exacting in what he's, what he's requiring of us. But the idea is not to rest in a kind of narcissism, but to imagine a, a self that is engaged in a kind of self reflect, a, a kind of self-examination, uh, Socrates, right? That makes life worth living such that then it will result in these arrangements that are much different. So I think, or what, what we have to do is tell the truth about who we are. We're not the best country in the world. We're not the most powerful people on the planet. We're fallen, finite creatures who are in this moment, in most cases, dying alone. We can't grieve with each other. Folk can't grab their mother's hands or run their fingers through their grandmama's head, her, her hair. We can't be the ones present when they're taking their last breath and they can look upon our eyes and say, no, why? Because we're revealing what we value and who we value, right? So the fact that they're rushing to open up the economy now reveals the character of the country. This is what they care about. And we have to announce boldly uh, and compassionately that we care about other things, other people, a different way of being in the world. And this is how we want to live moving forward um, and, to, and to act on that as aggressively uh, as we possibly can. This sounds such a silly question, but what's your view of Donald Trump? He is a singular player on this stage right this second. Yeah, you know, we vomited him up, right? At every moment in which the country has an opportunity to be otherwise, it doubles down on its ugliness. So you think about the Civil War, you think about Reconstruction, uh, and Reconstruction is this second founding, right? What do we get in response? We get convict leasing, we get Jim Crow, right? The value gap, as I put it in Democracy in Black, returns, this valuation of white people is more valued more than others, right? You think about the Civil Rights Movement of the mid 20th century, uh, where we have people just arguing for basic human dignity and first-class citizenship. What do we get in response? Call for law and order. The tax revolt in California, this, re this argument against big government, the erosion of the social safety net. That's the ugliness. What do we get in response to the election of Barack Obama? We get the Tea Party. We get voting, voter suppression and voter ID laws. And then we throw up Donald Trump. And we produce some vile, right, and in my in catastrophic, in this instance, response. Donald Trump is us, as I've said before, right? He, he is a reflection of what's at the heart of the country. And our challenge in this moment, even as we understand him as a singular figure, our challenge is not to exceptionalize him. Because now I'm gonna draw my religious studies uh, uh, background, because what we do is we displace our sins onto the scapegoat. And we think that the only thing that we need to do is get rid of him and we will be saved. And if you believe that, I got an affordable flat in Brooklyn to sell you. <laughs> 
I often end these uh, conversations by asking my guests what they think the story will be that the future, perhaps 50 years from now, um, will tell of now. Uh, what do you think? Oh, my goodness. Uh, it was a moment of dire choice. One way the story could be told is that we faced a momentous choice and we chose to be otherwise. The nation finally left behind the baggage that has kept it from being a truly genuine democracy. Or another version of the story will be, in the face of a momentous choice, the nation doubled down on its ugliness and it served as the last choice it ever could make. It served as the end of American civilization as we know. Eddie, thank you so very much, Professor Gloud. Really a great pleasure to talk with you, and I look forward to talking with you about the Baldwin book. Same here. Thank you so much for everything you do. You too. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm.